Good afternoon. Um, everyone, thank you for coming. So my name is Nina Kimball, and I am the chair of the Mass Commission on the Status of Women. And I am pleased to invite individuals and anybody from you know, organizations, elected officials, or there may be some people who are here now and may be joining us. And we are just excited to hear from people about issues that are facing um, women and girls in this community. Um, so I also wanted to thank um, our sister commissioners here. We have the Brockton um, Commission on the Status of Women, and we also have some members of the new Plymouth County Commission on the Status of Women, and we thank them for helping to organize this event and to get the word out and to bring people here. And um, we are also looking forward to just collaborating with them around this event and others. So the Mass Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women was um, legislatively created in 1998 um, and the mission of the statewide commission is to enhance opportunities and to provide a voice for women and girls in the Commonwealth. Um, so what we would also like to do, uh, one thing is that um, this is a public event and if, um, so this is, I don't think, we're not, are we being recorded? Yes. We are yes. being recorded. Yes. So if you do not, if you want to testify, and if you do not want to be recorded, just please let us know, because then we will make sure not to record that. Um, but please specify that at the beginning of your testimony. So what I'd like to do now is um, ask all of my sister commissioners to just briefly introduce themselves. And we're going to start over here on my right with the Brockton commissioners. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, my name is Janice Johnson Plumer. I'm a member of the Brockton Women's Commission as well as the newly formed Plymouth Commission uh, for Women. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the City of Champions, Brockton. My name is Kimberly Zuzwa, and I am the chair of the Brockton Commission uh, for Women's Issues. Hello, everyone. My name is Leona Martin, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight as well. And I'm a member of the Brockton Commission, as you know, and I'm the secretary on the Brockton Commission. We're all going to share. Rebecca? Hi, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Rebecca Bact. I am uh, the secretary of the State Commission, and I'm also the vice chair of the Program and Planning Committee. Um, as I said, I'm Nina Kimball. I'm the chair um, of the commission, and I um, will just say I've also been on the commission now for, um, this is my third year, and I was appointed by the Senate uh, president. Thank you all for coming. My name is Ruth Bramson. I was appointed to the commission by um, our governor, Charlie Baker, uh, after having served on the commission prior to that under Mitt Romney, our other governor, former governor. And it's a great pleasure to be here and look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Good afternoon. Welcome. I want to say thank you for coming out. I, I am Meredith Tewitt. I am on the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. I have been on the commission. I'm in the Boston area, and I was appointed by the Women's Legislative Caucus, and I want to say I'm going on my sixth year on the commission. I'm also chair of um, program and planning, and also I am the veteran on the commission. So I'm out of my sister commissioners, the 19 of us, I'm the only female veteran, so I claim a lot of stuff, you know. So I'm gonna pass on to my next sister. Who can read that? <laughs> uh, um, my name is Jean Fox. I'm in my second year on the state commission, uh, but I'd like to share that I was an original commissioner on the Bristol County Commission and served nine years in that capacity. I live in Freetown, I work in Boston, I am in Brockton frequently, the city of champions, uh, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Oh, they got their own. Okay, okay. Welcome, my name is Christina Witten O'Brien. I am a member of the Plymouth County Commission on Women. We were all just sworn in in July. I am a vice chair and heading up program and planning and look forward to hearing from you all today. Thank you for coming. 
Hi, my name's Elizabeth Aruda, and I'm a commissioner on the status of women for Plymouth County. So, um, thank you, and um, let me also say we're just delighted to be at the War Memorial Building here in Brockton. It is a gorgeous building, um, and so we want to also thank um, the, our hosts for, for, for doing this, and, and also thank um, Tobias Cowens, the Deputy Chief of Staff of Mayor Bill Carpenter, as well as Kimberly, um, for just um, bringing us to this beautiful place today. So thank you. Um, so in the past, our hearings have gathered testimony that brings attention to issues such as economic independence, um, self-sufficiency, um, um, just income insecurity, food insecurity, domestic violence, access to education, um, all kinds of issues, you know, that affect women and their families, um, child care, health care, et cetera. And this testimony allows the commission to um, form our policy agenda, our legislative agenda, and really inform the work that we do. And um, so it helps us to gather this testimony at the four public hearings that we hold a year so that it can accurately reflect the issues that women and girls are facing in the Commonwealth. So this is a very important part of our work to hear from all of you here today, as well as the work of our sister commissions. Um, so we're going to hear from local organizations, elected officials, um, and we do also say that if you have testimony in written format, we would um, we would like you to submit it to the commission, and we do gather all of the testimony, and it becomes part of our annual report to our appointing authorities. And so, please, if you do have written testimony, you can send it to, you can email it to mcsw at mass.gov. And is there an exclamation point? Is that part of the email? Okay, there's just an exclamation point for some reason. <laughs> I didn't think so. All right, mcsw at mass.gov. Okay, um, today, I don't know whether, as I say, people are still in traffic, but we are expecting some elected officials. Um, Representative Michelle Dubois, I think, is here. Stand, um, if you are. She's not here yet. Okay. Um, so we do have um, Faith Simon from Representative Cronin's office stand. Thank you very much for coming. All right. We also have Ann Beauregard, who is um, the Ward 5 City Councilor. That was a hand. Stan, Stan, thank you very much. Um, we may be getting Representative Joan Machino if th she comes. We will uh, recognize them when they arrive. Okay. You may. I'm sorry, I, ladies, you, I'll tend to do this off and on, but I want to acknowledge former Brockton City Councilor Shana Barnes, who, if it's Shana Stan, because I just went, yeah. Um, so if you're from Brockton and you know the Brockton Mayor's Commission, I want to say a strong force in getting them revitalized was Shana Barnes. That's wonderful. Thank you. All right, so um, then we are going to begin um, with the testimony. So the, there, the microphone is here in the beginning of the room, and what I will do is I'm going to go down the list, and people um, who have signed in and said that they wanted to testify, what I'm going to do is um, keep this to no more than five minutes, and that is just so that we can make sure that everybody who would like to testify has a chance, as well as people who may still be joining us. So the first person is Martha Testa. Now you can hear me. Hello. My name is Martha Testa. I've lived in Brockton for almost 30 years, and I am here today to talk about women caregivers who care for an elderly individual, which has become the new normal according to ARP, the American Association of Retired Persons. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this topic. 
While it is true that men are also involved in caregiving, most research on caregivers has focused on female caregivers because throughout the world, women are the predominant providers of care for family members with chronic health problems or disabilities. The Family Caregiver Alliance reported that in 2015, roughly 66% of all caregivers were women. Although caregiving can be provided to individuals of any age, my focus is on caregivers of older adults because that was my personal experience as I cared for my husband during his long illness from a slowly progressing fatal neurological disease known as spinocerebellar ataxia. Many caregivers find the experience to be satisfying and rewarding, and I was one of those individuals. Like most situations in life, each caregiving experience is unique. In my case, I was very fortunate to have a strong and loving relationship with my husband, the capability to perform his care and to be appreciated. It was an experience that I would not trade for anything, one that I wanted to do with my heart and soul, and one that I know will shape me for the rest of my life. Despite its rewards, though, caregiving often involves emotional, physical, social, and financial burdens. Even though there was profound personal satisfaction from caring for my husband, that does not mean that I never felt frustrated, isolated, burdened, anxious, exhausted, or burnt out. At the outset of my husband's illness, I was working full time, and my interest in working caregivers became heightened. Because women are more likely to be in the workplace and are more likely to have family caregiving responsibilities in the, than in the past, their earnings have become increasingly important to their family's financial stability, retirement security, and to the economy. The financial impact on working caregivers who leave the labor force due to caring for uh, caregiving demands can be severe. According to the Family Caregiver Alliance, long-term caregiving has significant financial consequences for, uh, for caregivers, particularly women. Caregivers personally lose about $659,000 over a lifetime, roughly $25,000 lost in Social Security benefits, about $67,000 lost in pension benefits, and more than $566,000 lost in wages. Many families face work family balance issues, but workers with elder care responsibilities usually experience it differently from those with child care responsibilities. What makes elder care especially challenging is that both its onset and its duration are unpredictable. When an older person becomes ill, roles, relationships, and expectations within the family change. Furthermore, more caregivers are assisting older family members with higher degrees of disability than in the past. Plus, they are more likely to be providing physically demanding and intimate personal care with activities such as bathing or using the toilet. Some policies have already been put in place to assist caregivers. In 1993, the Family Medical Leave Act was enacted to require employers to provide employees with job protection and unpaid leave. More recently, the new Massachusetts Family Medical Leave Act, which was passed this summer, uh, will be one of the most progressive paid family and medical leave laws in the country. Beginning in 2021, employees will Oh, I just wanted to finish this. Uh, thank you um, uh, for the opportunity and urge the commission to keep uh, caregivers on the list of priority policy issues for women. Thank you very much. Were you also taking care of children at the time that you were taking care of your husband? Because many, many times caregivers find themselves in a situation where they're taking care of an elder parent as well as um, children, sort of the sandwich gen generation yes, as well. Yes, like that's common. That wasn't my particular situation. I have a question for you. Did you find that you had the necessary emotional or frustration and things? I am grateful for the resources that I did have. Um, here in Brockton, Old Colony Elderly Services was able to um, provide 
really it was just um, caregiver check-ins, emails to me. I had hospice care for my husband because his condition was uh, fatal um, and terminal, obviously. Um, my purpose in bringing this forward is that the system, in my opinion, is fragmented. I happened to work in home health care for 25 years as a speech therapist, so I was familiar with a lot of um, the resources that were available and what we were eligible for and, and um, how the system works. But, and so I was fortunate in that regard, but not everyone has that advantage. Um, I also I wanted to recognize um, Representative um, Michelle Dubois, who has arrived. Thank, thank you. Okay, um, the next person listed here is um, Lisa Field. Hi. My name is Lisa Field, and I thank the Commission for the opportunity to testify today. I am here today representing the Massachusetts Nurses Association, the professional association and the largest union for registered nurses and health professionals in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Our organization represents more than 23,000 RNs and health professionals working in more than 85 health care facilities across the Commonwealth. We provide care to women and families in every healthcare setting and as such have a unique frontline perspective on the care and treatment of women and their families at the most vulnerable times in their lives. It is also important to note that our membership and our profession is more than 90% female. So we also bring a unique perspective on the treatment of women in the workplace. As a strong union with a long history of activism and advocacy on healthcare issues and other issues impacting women, we are proud of the work we have done to increase access to quality care for all residents of the Commonwealth to adequate healthcare services, as well as our, for our efforts to create safer working conditions in the healthcare workplace. But you need to know that as women in this society, even in the so-called progressive state called Massachusetts, to have our voices heard and our concerns addressed continues to be a constant struggle in a culture that devalues women's vo voices and calls upon women to go to great lengths to convince a male-dominated, profit-driven power structure to do what is right and just for our patients and for our own health and safety. It is fitting that you're holding this hearing in Brockton because Brockton and the surrounding area provides the most potent example of the current state of affairs for women and families, particularly the poorest women and families in this region. I'm referring to the closure last year of the maternity unit at Stewart Morton Hospital in Taunton. This unit provided crucial services for birthing mothers and their newborns to a community that has been hard hit by the opioid epidemic. It has among the highest rates of children born drug, drug affected. It was a needed service, especially for the women who lacked access to tr adequate transportation to seek services outside of the community. The closing of this service followed the previous closing of the hospital's pediatric service. Both closings were met with overwhelming and near universal opposition from all sectors of the community. Both closings were pursued in direct violation of agreements to made to that community by Stewart Healthcare. Both closings were in direct opposition to findings by the Department of Public Health that these were essential services to meet the public needs of the community. But Stewart went ahead with those closings anyways. They were able to do this because our state legislature has failed to provide any protection for communities to ensure that health care providers who amass massive profits from our communities to, to ensure access to all services for all residents. Morton patients have been redirected to Good Samaritan Hospital, a hospital right here in Brockton, and that has strained limited services right here in this community as well. The loss of these services is not unique. Major healthcare networks throughout this state have pursued similar closings of pediatric and maternity services by Partners Healthcare at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, by UMass Memorial at Lemonster Hospital, and by Bay State Health at Mary Lane Hospital. All these corporations are posting millions of dollars in profits and all are dominated by a male culture that thinks it's okay to terminate services for women and children and to force women and children to travel long distances for care. Our school nurses and public health nurses have seen women and children further hurt by the continued erosion for funding for school and public health services, with the closure of community clinics serving predominantly poor women and children. Our nurses see the rise in childhood asthma and other conditions 
caused by the poor housing conditions and other factors driven by a tax structure and economic system that fails to treat all with dignity and respect. Our nurses in long-term care see a system of care that is underfunded and understaffed, serving a predominantly female population who suffer their last days in such facilities, while the corporations that operate these facilities post millions of dollars in profits. Our nurses working in emergency rooms continue to see far too many women coming into their facilities battered and raped. Yep, thank you. Victims of domestic and community violence. And our nurses themselves are in constant struggle to provide care under conditions that are not safe and designed to, designed to not ensure the safety of, their, of the patients and themselves. No greater example of this is the most recent campaign for question one in the ballot. Nurses, after more than 20 years of attempting to convince a male-dominated legislature and healthcare system to heed our calls for safe patient limits to ensure safe patient care, were forced to go to the voters to achieve a safer standard of care for our patients. What we encountered was a shocking and disgusting campaign of lies and misinformation conducted by the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association to avoid being held accountable providing, for providing a safe standard of care for all patients in the Commonwealth. As union members, we have and continue to fight these forces as we have always done. As members of our broader society, we will continue to work politically and socially to advance the cause of women and to fight sexism where it counts. I'll submit the rest of my testimony. <laughs> Thank you. This, I'm sorry, hi, Meredith. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for your testimony. I have to say that up front. But I'm a staunch believer that if organizations such as the MNA puts their money and their backing and their power and their volunteers and their members behind the right candidates, mm -hmm. then we'll be able to make change, mm -hmm. right? So here's my challenge for you, because I get what you're saying, because it's something, when you talk about disenfranchised communities, those are the communities that I've worked with for many years, and Brockton is one of those communities, right? But we always have a struggle when we, the street workers, the grassroots workers, such as my sister commissioners and I, who are out there finding the right candidates, it's always hard for us to get organizations like the MNA to back them. So my challenge to you, as you're challenging us, is to work with us collaboratively so we can get those right candidates supported by MNA. You know, because if we can get women in office, mm -hmm. yes. you know what I'm saying? Totally and MNA sometimes doesn't support women like they should right. running Point for you know, so, taken. So I'm challenging you as much as you're challenging me right. to be able to work hard because I understand what you're talking about. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay. Um, so the next person who is on the list um, has asked for her statement to be read. Um, and her name is Lisa. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I guess you do need to go to the podium so that you can be video. No, it doesn't matter? doesn't matter. He can videotape you right there. Thank you. My name is Lisa. A resident of Brockton most of my life, I am here speaking today because I feel I have nowhere else to turn. I have been on a two-year journey to find a place for my autistic son to have a voice. Early on, I reached out to all the appropriate agencies, DCF, school district, DDS, mental health community, police, DA, and the CAC. I was advised to never give up, no matter what, because the road ahead would be hard because of my son's limited language. I followed this advice to the letter, which brings me here today. My experience highlighted a very flawed system that attacked me as a mother instead of providing help and protection for my son. Along the way, I recognized my family's story is not unique for parents with verbally limited children, sadly. In fact, a major equality for all children and adult victims with verbal challenges exists today. For DCF, it is not enough for a victim to explain they, explain they were hurt and who hurt them. DCF requires, requires all victims specifically described their, their abuse 
in detail verbally regardless of their deficit in order to screen in any report. The DA, as we all know, cannot prosecute abusers unless the victim can make a good verbal witness on the stand. Currently, the most vulnerable population is the least protected and have no recourse and are left to remain victims and tolerate a life of abuse and silence. There needs to be education to our schools, caregivers, and protection agencies on how to spot nonverbal signs of abuse with an action plan to protect these victims and support their protective caregiver. Also, mandated reporters must be given the freedom to express their concern to DCF without being questioned by their employers they, that they are following the same verbal guidelines as DCF. I would love to be part of this long overdue change and advocate for my son, as well as all the children out there that cannot specifically describe their hardship verbally. There are two concise ways to bring about this equality that I hope to see in Massachusetts. One, DCF screen and requirements modified for those that are nonverbal or verbally challenged. Specially trained staff on this population and freedoms make referrals to specialized trauma evaluation facilities. Two, help get Aaron's law passed and put into practice in Massachusetts as soon as possible with modified materials for verbally challenged. For those that are not familiar, Aaron's law requires public schools implement a prevention-oriented abuse program which, which teaches pre-K to 12th grade students, staff, and caregivers techniques to recognize abuse and tell how to tell someone. I welcome the opportunity to speak to members of this committee more about my journey as my son is still at risk and find ways to bring about this needed change to protect all of us verbal or nonverbal e equally. Thank you very much for listening to my current concerns and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll issue my to submit their says it's on. Okay, you got it. Thank you. And reminding people to submit their testimony in writing um, through the, um, our email. Okay, the next person uh, is um, Tina Cardoso. Hello everyone. So I'm not prepared for this because I walked in and they said that you can provide testimony. Um, I know there are folks here that can speak to the domestic violence that plagues our city, so I'm not gonna touch on that. But my name is Tina Cardozo. I'm with an organization called Criolas Unidas, which stands for K Verdian Women United. I started this organization a couple years ago because of the need for us to empower K Verdian women to be more involved in the community as we are, women are the pillars of the community. So our mission is to empower women and to also touch on a lot of the issues that affect us as women, such as DV, mental illness, suicide, depression. Um, one of the biggest issues here in Brockton that we're dealing with is the whole immigration experience. So I think that this is something that the commission really, really should tackle this day and age is the trauma in immigration. A lot of our K Verdian women leave their children behind to seek um, a better life here in the U.S. And then they bring their kids over once their kids are teenagers. So if you can imagine the separation um, component to that and then come into a new culture, having to learn a new language and having to get to know their parents, um, it's traumatic for the women, it's traumatic for the child, and a lot of the issues that we're having in this city in particular, I can speak to, I don't have data or anything like that, but I do run a women's group for Cape Verdean women, and a lot of the issues that we're dealing with is the whole immigration piece and the separation. We know it's a hot topic these days, and we really wish that organizations like yourself would um, push to do more around um, helping women cope with leaving their children behind and then bringing them here, and vice versa, helping you know the kids who are separated from their parents in coming over. 
So again, Criadas Unidas, Cape Verdean Women Organization that's helping women deal with DV, substance abuse, um, depression, and the immigration trauma. So I can submit something in writing as well later on. But thank you for hearing me. Oh, hold on a minute. Hold on. Questions? I have a question. Um, I work with Broughton Public Schools, and I encounter a lot of women, and the majority of them have children that are in, still in Cape Verde, and then they're here trying to hold it down and to provide resources for their household. So I see firsthand, and a lot of times they're terrified um, because I, I help them get SNAP as well, so when you start mentioning that to them, they're like, what questions are you gonna ask me? Is this gonna go to another agency? So I see firsthand, and they're terrified. You can see it in their faces. So if there's anything that we can do or collaborate with you to enable, to kind of get together, to work with you and your organization to kind of figure out what we can do and what strategies we can come up with so that they can, you know, get their children and have them here with them. That's awesome. And when you say the schools, I think that um, having more school-based therapy is very important. I think when they reconnect a lot of these parents and kids, they just don't know how to do that. So in Cape Verde, we don't talk a lot about the you know depression, trauma, or anything like that. We sweep everything under the rug in our culture. So I think getting these women to talk has been huge. And my little group that I have every Wednesday at the association, these are the issues that are coming out. And their kids are acting out because they don't know how to deal with um, their parent. They're getting to you know, kind of reunite um, with the parents. And so they're resentful a lot of times that the parent left them behind. And they're acting out at school and acting out in the streets. So I think more school-based therapy, more in-home therapy for parents and for children when they do um, reconnect to kind of go through some of those issues is very important. Thank you. Tina, don't run away. I want to thank my Brockton sister commissioner over there for um, speaking and asking to collaborate with you because I know the Brockton Women's Mayor's Commission would, would be a good fit. But I just wanted to get you to answer a question because I'm watching the faces of everyone sitting in the audience. And as a um, derivative naturalized citizen, I need you to answer this question so they realize that these women didn't just leave their children because they wanted to. So can you explain why they separated from their children so that those that are in the audience can understand that they just didn't leave them to come to America, you know, that there's a reason why they did that. Oh, excuse me, I turned itself back on. <laughs> Well, of course, it's poverty. You know, it's a poor country, so a lot of the folks, the women come over. Sometimes it's the men that come over and leave the families behind, and then they bring over. This is another scenario you probably encounter. They bring their children over, but now they have step-wives um, because they have to get married in order to get their um, documents. So now the kids are being raised with the step parent and the mother's back home. That I've mentor kids at Brockton High that are having a real difficult time with the step parent. So in an effort to seek a better life for their kids, they're having to take on really tough um, situations. And so that's a huge thing that hasn't been discussed a lot in the past when we look at different curriculums that deal with violence prevention. Immigration trauma is not part of those curriculums. So with Criadas Unidas, we actually got a grant from Good Samaritan and adapted a curriculum around violence prevention and incorporated immigration trauma, so we're trying to tackle a lot of that, but I think more and more as we see things that are happening you know, in the media around immigration that we really need to look at the trauma that these kids are suffering because of immigration. So thank thank you. you. I just wanted to piggyback on let you know, hear that, because I, a lot of times when people hear about the immigration issue and the children and the parents being separated and their parents leaving them in the islands or wherever to come here to get a green card or immigration papers, visas, work visas, whatever it is, there's a reason. And laws have changed and it costs a lot of money now to get a green card or to even study and pass the immigration exam and answer what, who is the 14th president. Some American-born people can't even tell you that. But 
immigration, you have to. So I can say I, I understand where you're coming from because my mom and dad left me and my brothers with my grandmother, came to the States on a work visa, lived here, did all of their paperwork seven years to get naturalized. And because we were still under the age of 18, they were able to do paperwork to bring us over, but they had to raise the money at the same time that they were here doing all of this stuff to be able to pay for four children to be able to come over and then do the paperwork. And then we became derived citizens because of this mass separation. So they left, I was two when they left me and I got here when I was eight, you know. So me and my brothers, you know, for a while there had to learn, my mother had to travel back and forth every summer so we'd know who she was, you know. So now it costs more than it did when my mom and dad did that. You know, now the cost is high, you know, and the issues are different. So parents are leaving their children longer because they can't make the money. And then when they do make the money, they have to pass the test, yeah. you know? And, and I don't wanna say we have a staff person at, at the MCSW who is leaving us because of our new, not new, but our immigration issues and how they are impacting us. So we understand we are looking at it and how we can work but um, thank you for standing here, thank and you. I hope you are able to do something with the Brockton Commission and maybe the Plymouth County Regional Commission because it's an issue that we have to look at because of the trauma. And thank also you. for people to realize that when they do leave their children, they're not just leaving them anywhere, they leave them with grandparents and family members, and so they feel confident that their kids are gonna be okay, but when the kids come to America, it's a whole different ball game, because we teach our kids all you know about this nuclear family and how things are supposed to be, and there's a different image here, and the kids feel like, boy, I didn't grow up like that. I grew up with you know my grandparent or my uncle or my cousin, so, there's that missing link almost, and the kids feel lost. So I think that it's important for schools to start to teach more around those issues, and again, school-based therapy is important. So, Tina, thank you. And if you do want to put together anything in writing, we would love to have that. Thank you so much for your um, testimony. Um, the next person is Katie Tyler. Tyler, and I'm the Vice President of Violence Intervention and Prevention at Health Imperatives. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Speak into the, microphone. the Health Imperatives mission is to improve the health and well-being of low-income or vulnerable families and individuals in southeastern Massachusetts. Some of our programs include eight sexual and reproductive health clinics, our domestic violence shelter, Penelope's Place, three home visiting programs for young parents, and our rape crisis center, A New Day. Through these programs, we serve 30,000 individuals each year, and many of our clients are women and girls. To give you an understanding of the comprehensive care a client receives when accessing our services, I would like to give you a brief case example. This case example illustrates the issues women face regularly in southeastern Massachusetts. A woman goes to South Shore Hospital after being raped. Health Imperatives medical advocates are contacted to provide advocacy and support while the client receives the rape examination kit. The medical advocate connects the client to our rape crisis center, A New Day, where the client receives counseling services. The A New Day counselor refers the client to our sexual and reproductive health clinic where she receives the remaining medication to complete the PEP medication regimen she was started on in the hospital. PEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis medication, is a preventative medication for patients at risk of contracting HIV. Once connected to the sexual and reproductive health clinic, the client continues to receive gynecological care at the clinic. I hope the case example given highlights the intersection of physical health issues and domestic violence and sexual assault. In fiscal year 17, rape crisis centers in Massachusetts responded to over 13,000 calls. An additional 560 calls were answered by the statewide Spanish language hotline. 
In fiscal year 17, rape crisis centers provided over 16,500 individual counseling, client accompaniment, and collateral services. During the same year, medical advocates supported over 1,000 sexual assault survivors seeking medical help and evidence collection in hospitals in the aftermath of an assault. In fiscal year 18, a new day, which is our rape crisis center program in Brockton, and a new day serves 36 towns across Plymouth County, uh, Bristol County, and Norfolk County. Uh, in fiscal year 18, we served about 700 clients through group services, individual advocacy services, and individual counseling. And we served over 100 clients through medical advocacy services and reached over 2,000 individuals through our prevention work. <clears throat> in fiscal year 17, Massachusetts Department of Public Health funded emergency domestic violence shelters nearly, served nearly 3,000 individuals and nearly 2,300 children. The statewide domestic violence hotline, SafeLink, received over 28,000 calls, and over 21,000 of those calls were requests for shelter. In fiscal year 18, Penelope's Place Shelter served 48 women and children, and the shelter is typically full about 360 days of the year. The demand for beds is indicated by the number of calls placed to the SafeLink hotline each year. I hope these statistics illustrate the need for domestic violence and sexual assault services in this region. The demand for services for se sexual assault and domestic violence providers has increased since the inception of the Me Too movement, and it is imperative that these programs continue to receive funding and support. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you do you have a particular ask um, of what the commission to do, other than, or is it to continue um, pushing to, for, to fund these services? Continuing to fund these services, yes. Domest uh, yeah, there is absolutely a need for more shelter and housing for domestic violence victims. There's a scarcity of shelter. Um, 37 communities, you said? 36. 36. Mm -hmm. 36, 37, 35, too many. Um, how do you do that? How do you, how do you have all those tendrils out there? That, to me, seems like that's an issue. Geographically, that must be an enormous challenge. Yes. <laughs> it's an enormous challenge, and that's our rape crisis center in New Day, and we try our very best to meet victims where they're, they're at and to try and um, help them overcome any transportation barriers. So we have satellite sites in Quincy and Weymouth, um, and we go to various locations where we can meet with victims. So we might travel to a library, things like that. So transportation has to be a huge barrier. How many counselors do you have to work with all of these people? Seven. Oh, my God. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned that you service uh, the southeast region. Is Brockton one of your areas? Okay. Brockton is probably uh, the town that is definitely the town where we see the most victims. Okay, thank you. Yep. So a quick question. Sure. The Department of Public Health, approximately how much in dollar-wise funding did you receive in fiscal year 19? And are you realizing that it's going down? Is it remaining the same? We received an increase um, and we received close to 500,000. Any indications fiscal year 20 yet? Um, I think, I hope it'll stay stable. That's my hope. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Thank um, you for your time. Katie. Okay, Barbara Brooks. and thank you for um, allowing this to happen. And um, so my name is Barbara Brooks. I'm the community coordinator for the Brockton WIC program. Our uh, main office is located here at 795 Pleasant Street in Brockton. Um, if for anybody that doesn't know exactly what WIC does, um, we're a nutrition program. Our goal is to improve the health and status of families by providing nutrition and health education, nutritious foods and resources um, to health and human uh, sources or programs. 
Um, our caseload as of this hearing today is 5,230 participants, and the breakdown is um, 1,224 women, 1,203 infants, and 2,803 children. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the needs that we see amongst our women that we serve are, I'm just gonna go uh, touch upon five different things. Um, English as a second language is um, something that we see. We have staff that um, are bilingual and we can do our appointments in the, those languages, but um, sometimes our participants' need, needs are greater than just nutrition and um, we can't always communicate that well with them and the resources um, are limited the, those that don't, for those that don't speak, speak English. The resources that are available locally either cost too much or have long waiting lists um, to access. Lack of understanding leads to lack of many things for mothers trying to raise children in a culture full of resources um, that they can't access simply because they don't understand. Um, and as Tina, right, Tina was explaining. So of course, you know, when, when women come here, our immigrants that don't speak English, I think that they're more at risk for being taken advantage of. And you've got the domestic violence, you've got all of that um, going on. They can't, even, they can't even fend for themselves because they can't speak English. They can't go and say, I need help, um, especially if they can't connect with others that do speak their language. So if we could, um, get English is, you know, more resources. There are resources, but they're so limited. Um, transportation is a second topic here. Moms without vehicles or financial resources to use public transportation limits them and their children from accessing simple things such as the WIC program. They can't even get to WIC. I know we are uh, familiar with PT1, and I think there's something new called Uber Health. I don't know much about that, but I think it's kind of like PT1. Um, but there's other things, you know, over and above, you know, WIC appointments that children need um, and mothers need. You know, when, when our children are happy, moms are happy. Um, and those resources, you know, being able to get around um, helps children uh, thrive and get around to, to important, um, you know, things and things that are available in the community. There's, again, there's so many things that are available through the uh, Family Resource Center. But... If families can't get there, they can't access that. Um, child care for working mothers. This has always been um, ongoing, and I know we keep expanding child care access. Um, child care is so very expensive for those that have low to moderate income, and it makes it impossible for them to work, uh, forcing them to rely on public benefits to survive. Um, so I know I've mentioned this actually to Michelle um, a while ago. If companies somehow could get a tax break, if they kept childcare within their facilities where people work, where they could bring their children to work and, um, and offer childcare for a really deep discount where they could work, make an income, and, um, and keep their children close. So I don't know if companies want to do that, but if there was a benefit for them to do that on site, um, you know, it would, we wouldn't have to keep pouring money into child care um, that we, we, and I'm so happy that we do have it, that they do have new slots are opening up all the time, but can we keep doing that? You know, we've got to do something different, I think. Anyway, um, housing is an ongoing problem. Uh, rather than more shelters and subsidized rents, with the exception of DV, we do need, we are seeing a, um, I was talking to the family self uh, family support coordinator, and she said, "For okay, um, our family support coordinator said she's been seeing an increase in domestic violence as of recent. We're not really sure why. We know that tends to happen in January. It seems to be happening early this year. Um, but for we do need more shelters for those that have you know domestic violence um, situations. But I'm talking about the families. We're seeing more families in shelters." And I don't know if anybody's familiar with the um, FF, FSS, Family Self-Sufficiency Programs. They're small. I mean, we have them here in Brockton, but only certain families can access it. They have to be in public housing. They can't be on Section 8. Um, the model is great. If only more people could access it, um, we'd have more families buying their own homes instead of being stuck in this cycle of homelessness. You know, they get, they get an apartment for a short period of time, and then they're homeless again. Um, I just think that there's, there's something to be said and it's worth looking into. 
um, to use that model. Last thing, oh no, I already said that. English is the second language. And that's it. I think that's. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Um, everything that you're saying, Barbara, I, I know all too well. And I think a lot of times we take for granted what we have and don't realize that there, you know, there are people that do not. So, like I mentioned earlier, I work with parents and families and help them do SNAP. A lot of times these families need these benefits, but they'll say, I can't come and meet you because I don't have a car. Right. Or my spouse is working and I have to wait for him to come home and take me to meet you. In terms of transportation, it, it's just, it's an ongoing cycle. If they have children, they want to work, but they can't because they can't afford to pay for the child care. And then when they are able to get a voucher, there are no daycare slots available for them. I see this on an ongoing basis daily. So I'm just wondering as commissions, at Plymouth as well as Brockton, how can we kind of come together and conjure up something and put some policy in place to enact or I don't know, spearhead to enforce that these needs have to be met for, the, for women, especially. Because this is, I mean, they need the benefits, they need the assistance, but they just can't. And it just pains me because, like I said, you know, we take for granted what we have and what was, for me, I'm always complaining about something. But then when I meet with a, a mother who's telling me that I just can't work, right. or I work two, three jobs, and I just can't, it, it's disheartening. And then the children are, um, you know, if they're working two or three jobs. Um, I'm not, I'm not advocating more benefits and more, you know, more tax dollars, but um, giving them what they need uh, so that they are self-sufficient. That should be, and it could be as simple as education. They're usually hardworking, but I feel like they get burnt out trying this and trying that, and yeah. being misdirected, and lack of, lack of communication. You know, they don't always know what to do, um, and they can't always speak. You know. Right, right, right. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to just kind of say, Barbara, around the um, lack of communication, mm -hmm. just because they don't speak the language, um, I'm just thinking that in a city like Brockton, where we have so many different languages, cultures, and so on, and people that speak languages, is there a way that we could work together with people in the community to maybe volunteer to help with that? Because right. it's a shame yeah. to think of people not getting services because they can't speak the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think sometimes churches will do that. They'll offer English as a second language. But it, again, um, there's so many people that need need language, need to um, learn to speak English. Some of them don't necessarily want to or they're intimidated for some reason. Um, I just, I do believe it needs to be expanded. You know, we see it all the time. People come in, I only speak English, unfortunately, and I can only, um, I try, you know, we try, but I'm reaching out for those, uh, we have staff that are bilingual. And we do have a language line, so we're okay. You know, when it comes to nutrition, we can use our language line, but I know when those people go out to go to the store, or if they're trying to access something and they don't understand, they could, they, I think that they are more likely to be taken advantage of because they can't understand English or they don't understand the culture. The family center would be a great place, but I don't think they have, I don't think they have English as a second language. I have the list that I know of. Um, I just think that it's a missing piece in the in, a, in a, this community. Um, Barbara, I'm wondering, so what, what are the main languages that you are looking for? Um, in this area, service? so it would be it's Cape Verdean, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and Haitian, French, Haitian, Creole. That's majority. We have a few other languages, but um, I do know from usually when they have English as a second language, if there's if they're learning English, they'll merge different cultures or different languages. I, I went to one that was, uh, she, it was Indian. The woman was Indian, and she was in with several Asian. Um, and they were so excited to learn English. You know, to even, I would come and I would, this was back in Quincy. Um, I used to work in the Quincy program, and um, yeah, they, they were excited to hear a speaker come and practice English with, you know, 
Well, I guess I, because I wonder, you know, one of the things is if you think about high school and community college and other programs where you've got people who are learning Spanish, they're learning Portuguese, they may speak French, and you've got a lot of students who are dying for some kind of immersion or some kind of ability to simply speak the language that they're learning in a classroom. And if there might be some way to get somebody to, you know, through any of those programs as a way, I mean, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's good for the students who are learning the language to do some kind of, um, you know, right. emerging of that, yeah. Something, I mean, it may, that may be a way that the community can get together with, you know, see a need mm -hmm. that can be also educational, you know, two ways. I think Catholic Charities here in Brockton is probably the larger ESL program that I know of. I, I think that they have about 200 students at a time. And that, but that waiting list, well, yeah. The waiting lists are very long. I was just about to say that there is a, a number of uh, programs that are out there that exist here within the Brockton community. However, there are very long waiting lists for folk, and I also think about um, uh, Training Association of America that works with the immigrant population where there's a backlog. So we have to figure out how we can get either through that backlog or identify other opportunities uh, so we can have those services made available. I think there needs to be some sort of incentive. If, say, for example, a, 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 example, a church was going to pick up the, you know, um, idea of doing this, or even the family center, there has to be some sort of incentive, you know, I don't think anybody's just gonna pull it all together unless it was family. Like family will take care of family in their culture. You know, they'll teach them English. And young children, I think when they're under 18, I've seen a, what's a 12 year old, 12, 13 year old, she came here, she was from um, China. When she came, she couldn't speak any English. And by the time she was 16, she was speaking, she worked hard at it though, but their brains work differently. Once you, you know, if you've got a mom here that's trying to do so much else um, that comes, they just aren't uh, equipped anymore. You know, our brains don't, don't work the same. You know, once we reach 25, we can't learn it. Is the truth? It's, it's, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't come as easy, but do, not to say it doesn't come at all, you know, that if they have the, uh, had the opportunity. I find people that do speak other languages, if they have the opportunity to practice, anybody learning another language. Um, this is uh, Farah, I hope you, I don't mind you putting you on the spot, but um, Farah speaks Arabic, but she's English speaking. So we have another one of our staff that speaks Arabic, and um, they've been enjoying conversation in our office because they don't get to practice with anybody. Um, but, but, so that's why I'm just wondering if one of the community colleges or something that's local where students, they so need the way to, to practice that there could be a way to do something where they're getting credit, so there's the motivation, mm -hmm. and you're getting a need filled as long as you know, there's nothing that is confidential. We're not... I mean, I'm not talking about like mental health services, but we're talking yeah, about so if colleges, you know, WIC and yeah. SNAP and I mean are, other kind of services. Are you saying if uh, colleges offered it, you mean had a classroom where they? It's almost like an, not like an internship, but often there may be something where you need, you know, some type of practice of the language. I mean, it, it could be just a way to reach out to a community college that's teaching either Spanish or French or Portuguese mm -hmm. to say, do you have students at a, you know, a higher level who might be able to do credit? It's like an, it is kind of like an internship, right? And that, you know. So the students would be teaching, like if they could take on one person that... Mm, no, I don't no. think they would be They're well, providing they some trans... I thought you needed translation. In oh, I see. Not English translation. is a second language. I'm Learning English, yeah. I'm talking about ESL. Yeah. I, I hope I'm clarifying what you intended, Nina, which is not that these students would teach English, but that they would help people by speaking to them in their native languages to allow them to sign up for the services that they might not be able to access, mm -hmm. getting, getting to the resources that are available through English-speaking institutions so that it would act as a translator to 
both linguistically and sort of as to how to achieve getting those resources and services. So a step short of English as a second language, which would be a different thing and also valuable, but to meet people where they are and to help them sign up for the things that they need. Right. And it is that simple. Like they, they get, um, they don't even want to try because they've a tried or they just can't even get that far. They don't have enough English to even, you know, they might, they, and their communities are very small. And then they're at risk. They're at risk for, like we said earlier, domestic violence, people uh, working them, overworking them, um, if they can't speak English and can't fend for themselves. And they'll cling to the small community that understands their language um, because they, probably came from an even worse situation, but it doesn't mean they have to stay in that here, you know. Um, we see a, a lot of uh, people at the WIC program. We don't always know. They're, we are there to educate them on nutrition. We do have a family support coordinator. Um, if we see a family has additional um, uh, problems, issues that go beyond the scope of what a nutritionist can do. They visit with the, the family support coordinator. She actually speaks four, four languages, so she can talk to them in many languages. So that's helpful, but yeah, so am I up? Oh. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I, I would just say that the, the things that you're pointing out are things that we hear at so many of our hearings, which is how issues of language, transportation, childcare, housing, that they're all so related to what women are suffering, you know, across the Commonwealth. Um, but I think being overlaps. creative, and I'm not saying more money, more money, I'm saying self-sufficiency. Um, people are happier when they can, can fend for themselves, speak for themselves, buy their own home pay their own child care if it's affordable. You know what I mean? If it's within a company. I remember years ago when my daughter was little, I tried to uh, get into a company that had a really beautiful daycare. I didn't get the job, but that's, that's okay. They, um, I think they ended up going out of business, but they, at the time, they were very good to their employees and they had a beautiful daycare um, on site. So how nice is that to have your children close by and you know, you're not driving to another place, it's less exhausting. Um, and then to have it be affordable would be a dream, you know, for some, some moms and families. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, right here we're on Shana Burner. Shana Barnes. Shana Barnes. Shana Barnes. Barnes. <laughs> I know the handwriting. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, ladies and attendees. Um, if, I'm just going to raise this a little bit. Uh, thank you for having this uh, session and making it available to the uh, residents of Brockton and the surrounding areas. This is definitely needed. Um, and as it was mentioned earlier, the Women's Commission had uh, gone out of practice, I, I guess, uh, for some time. Um, and it was truly my honor to work with the rest of the council in the mayor's office. And uh, Andrea Burton was here earlier. She was actually very, very uh, instrumental in actually casting the wide net to find these amazing women to serve on our commission. So I just wanted to recognize her um, in a public setting as well. So um, one thing I, I believe Lisa spoke about it earlier when she was talking about um, some of the, the services that m and kind of deals with and the things that, that they do in conjunction uh, with their just regular nursing services and then some of the, the adjunct things that they do, ad hoc things. One thing that, that I hadn't heard yet, we're trying to find, um, I guess, some more robust um, um, services for women with um, drug addictions. That's a huge, huge thing. Nobody, you know, is, is immune to that. It's not new news. Um, but having, you know, had, having, having had it happen in my own family, um, you know, and trying to find some resources for, for a family member, it's impossible, absolutely impossible. And in my former life uh, as a social worker, this was 11 years ago or so when things weren't as bad as they are now, it was virtually impossible to find uh, some uh, substance abuse services for some of the mothers on, of the children on my caseload at the time. And there was one center, um, I believe, uh, what is it, High, I, one of the affiliates, I think, of High Point uh, over on Meadowbrook um, in Brockton for a, a short time, but then 
it just kind of faded away, if I remember correctly. And I don't recall there ever being anything to replace that. And you know, we're seeing a lot of, and I, I know I saw some friends um, in social services, and they're seeing a lot of the secondary parenting of uh, grandparents, parenting their, grand ch their grandchildren because the parents have fallen into um, some kind of addiction, alcohol, drugs, whatever, any kind of thing now. Um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a huge problem. It really is a problem, and I think that we need to put a little more energy. And I think, too, you know, if it's woman-driven, it'll be, you know, uh, woman, women will succeed on it. So I think we need to really focus on trying to find specific services for women, not just a general um, substance abuse program, because as we all know, women have certain issues that are very different from men. And actually, too, there needs to be a multicultural component as well, because in some cultures, they don't speak about some of those kinds of challenges and some of those kinds of things, as, as my sister Tina had said earlier. So, um, you know, just, and I know it's, it's hard, it's not going to happen overnight, and finding uh, the qualified people to be able to respond to these kinds of things appropriately and quickly and effectively, I know it's going to be difficult, and, and I know I'm not, you know, planting a seed or anything, but I'm just kind of watering that seed for, for, the, for this commission um, to, to really think about doing that as well in small uh, doses and then, you know, statewide, and I know that the governor is, um, from what I understand, he's committed to also uh, working on that, but just putting a bug in his ear, too, that um, it's not just one size fits all for a substance abuse. It, it is, um, we need something specific for women and their issues. So that was about it. <laughs> Hi, Mary, how are you? I haven't seen you in so long. It's good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Brockton commissioners. <laughs> So before I ask the question, I have to tell you, everywhere I used to go, they used to say to me, Mary, you know there's another young lady that looks just like you, dresses like you, she's in politics like you, and I'm like, huh? Right? And then they would, yes, and they would say, oh, we thought she was you when we saw the shoes, and then we looked up and it wasn't you. So finally, after a year and a half about hearing about right. each other, right. we bumped into each other at an, at an event. Yes. And I was like, oh, I like your shoes. And she was like, yeah, I like your shoes. I, and she says, hi, I'm Shayna. I said, oh, you're her. Uh, that is and that's how true. we met. I'd walk through the state house and they'd be like, Mary. I'm like, no, I'm Shayna, but I heard about her and I gotta find her. That is 100% true. It is 100% true. So, so it's a pleasure seeing you, <laughs> Good sis. To see you again. Right? So um, thank you for that conversation around substance abuse around women. And, and yes, it's true. When we did finally do legislation and separated women with substance issues out of Framingham DOC and into uh, mental health facilities mm -hmm. or substance abuse facilities, we are still short because mm -hmm. we only have Taunton, mm -hmm. right? 30 beds. 30 beds. Yeah. That's it. You know, so, so thank you for that because that's something I didn't even, that hasn't connected for a while. But substance abuse issues, women, women with children. Right. You know, right. and then the reunification of those women with their children. So I want to make sure that we get that in our notes so we'll look into that because that's something we have to talk about. You know, and I, I have to tease, I'm sorry, I have to tease the chair of um, the Brockton Commission because she wore Brockton champion colors today, red and black. She sure did, right? look at it. And, <laughs> and thank you for the red and black as Brockton colors. <laughs> Right, but I have to say, Sister Delta. Oh yes, she's not a Delta. Yes, I know. Okay, she's, I know she is a she's proud an AKA. Member so I just have Alpha to say, Alpha you know, she's not wearing mint green. So <laughs> I was clocking that though, just to let you know, I saw that. <laughs> I know, I saw the pin too. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Shana? Um, oh, oh, right. Go ahead. Barbara. Oh, you have to. Oh. Oh. We've, we've seen an increase, of course, um, ongoing over like a decade from the WIC program of women that are uh, struggling with addiction. So there's um, the state, our WIC program at the state has been aware of this, and I think um, there's been more of a push to have more resources. There's actually something new I, I got in about the last month called the Journey Project. 
So it's online. Um, I just tried to pull it up and then my alarm went off. But um, so I can give that to you. It's called thejourneyproject.com. Um, yes, it's Massachusetts has put it together. And I'm not sure who actually put it together, but I'm sure either DPH or not sure. It's from Massachusetts. Um, so you, if you go on, you'll see there's six women that they've videoed that have um, gone through a recovery of opioids, and um, they talk about their experience. It's somebody, um, Megan Perry, have you ever heard of Megan Perry? So she's, yeah, if you Google her, she's a recovery coach. She was one of the ones in the video. But they have that. They actually have a portal now that um, you can go on and you can um, check on the map, uh, the portal map that shows resources that could be for women. We're on there. Not that we do services for opioids, but we would provide anybody um, services, even if they're using. You know, sometimes um, our moms are either we know they're using or they're um, on a rec they're in trying to be, you know, trying to get into recovery using. Um, not methadone, but they use a different one for pregnant women. Yes, thank you. Yes. So there's that, and then inside of the Champion Plan, um, I can't remember the name, name of it, but there is a whole level dedicated to families, both those that are um, in recovery or want to be in recovery, or families. They've got childcare, they've got workshops. Um, I can't think of the name. Yes, thank you. So Stairway to Recovery. Stairway. Yeah, so Stairway to Recovery is um, located inside of um, the Champion Plan, and I can't remember the name of the building off the top of my head, but I think everybody here from Brockton is familiar with it. You had said you're familiar with it, right? So you refer, are you? Okay. Right, so, so that's a resource too. Um, it is, it continues to be a problem though. I agree and thank you for sharing because, um, yeah, but I think that they're aware and, you know, things are coming in, in place for it. Yeah, so. <laughs> Since Shana mentioned it. <laughs> um, in our culture, um, drug addiction, not so much, but alcoholism is huge. And I feel like sometimes a lot of the funding goes to opioid addiction and not so much to alcoholism, which is huge in our immigrant population. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for that. So, I'll, so I'm going to give it back to Nina so we can go to our next. But I want to say this. What you just said, Tina, about the opioid money. So I have some sisters that work with um, substance abuse and substance use um, issues with women in recovery and so on. And I used to say to them, oh, you know, opioid money, come on. And she, they said to me, Mary, we get the opioid money, we use it for all substance abuse, right? So if you can launch a program and, and focus it on women and, it, and women in, in substance issues and get that grant money, work with the opioid issue and get that money into, the, into your program, that's the way they started doing it. And because it's there, you know, we waited years for them to funnel some money into substance abuse. So let's use it for what we have our issues, you know? Yeah, so back to Nina. Um, can I just clarify? So thank you for that, um, that information, and, and it's really helpful for us to also hear about um, resources in, in local communities, um, and because that's also something that we, you know, that comes into our, um, into our report and information we can give out. So um, the, the journey project, Barbara, that you were talking about, is that specifically women who've gone through substance abuse? It, it, mothers, okay. And then you talked about stairway to recovery, and then you said at the Champion Plant, in, inside the Champion Plant, is this plan, the Champion Plan. Everyone knows what that is, I don't, but. Oh, it's a, build, it's a building in Brockton? It's a program, okay. 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 Got it. Oh. Oh. Okay. So, 
So the police station is also a place that can help people find beds, people who are going through substance abuse, you know, issues there. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, where are we? Um, somebody who might possibly wants to testify, Julie Melu. All right. How do you pronounce your name? Maida. Oh, that's a D. Okay. Thank you. And this was super appropriate timing. Um, and I'm really nervous, so uh, I apologize. Um, Oh, good. Well, that's okay good to, to know. Thank you, because you're hiding it very well. It's okay to be nervous. Um, my name is Julie Maida, and I am a person in long-term recovery and the founder of an organization, 501c3, called Sober Mommies Incorporated. Did you say that Absolutely. <laughs> my name is Julie Maida, and I am a person in long-term recovery. I've been sober, uh, abstinence-based recovery since uh, May 2nd of 2000. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I say that um, not for acknowledgement, but to really stress that my testimony is coming from a place of experience. Um, I am also the founder and executive director of a program called Sober Mommies Incorporated. We support any and all pathways to recovery. Um, I personally got, uh, found my recovery via a 12-step program, but soon found that many women who avoid 12-step programming for whatever personal reasons are left to their own devices. Oftentimes they're told, call us when you're ready, um, you know, and there aren't enough uh, readily available supports for women um, who may not identify as quote unquote alcoholic or addict. Um, or who may just be drinking too much, or especially in this, um, this mommy juice culture that we have going on, um, you know, not so happy mommy hour. Um, the, our society is like forcing alcohol down a lot of mom's throats, um, and there's just not enough support. Um, so the groups that we run um, are both online and in person. Um, where women can just come, so women who are in or contemplating recovery from substance use disorder or misuse. I'm also one of the six journey moms um, from the Journey Project. I had purple hair, um, which has since grown out, but um, still the same. Uh, just addressing, you know, some of the things that it's so difficult. Recovery itself is difficult, um, but balancing motherhood, loss of um, parental rights. Um, I work with a lot of women who, you know, give birth and are told immediately by a, a state worker that they're never going to receive uh, custody back of their children, which is very uh, obviously discouraging. Um, and then everyone is really shocked when that person has a reoccurrence. Um, but there's just not enough hope for those women, or and there's not enough people standing by. Um, I know at many hospitals they have. Um, for NAS, uh, people who volunteer to hold their babies, and there aren't enough programs for people to hold the moms, in my opinion. Um, so I also do some community-based case management, um, and my weeks are filled with phone calls and visits trying to assist a great number of women wanting and willing to receive help um, with limited ability and resource. Just last year, I had a woman who was eight months pregnant on three different waiting lists sleeping in the parking lot of the Salvation Army in Brockton. The most that I could do was bring her blankets because I couldn't, she was um, a DV survivor and she had a trauma history that as long as my arm and refused to go to, she, she could not go to a shelter because of the PTSD and there was literally nothing that I could do um, except again, bring her blankets and a pillow. Um, and so there's just not enough, um, Massachusetts, keeps saying that women and children are the priority, but the bed count for detox speaks quite differently. Um, and also keeping women with their children. I, when I got sober, my daughter was four, and there weren't, you know, in 2000, I don't even, nobody even suggested that there was a program that I could bring my daughter to. So we were separated. Um, and so my recovery routine very much discluded having to find childcare. And when I got custody back, I was like, uh, you know, it was very difficult to um, reincorporate myself into the motherhood role, um, and balancing those two things is very difficult. And many of the women that we serve struggle with that. Um, they struggle with 
lack of uh, being the custodial parent and the shame that goes along with that because, quote unquote, a, a child's place is with their mother. Um, and the stigma associated with not only addiction but also recovery. Um, and, you know, reincorporating themselves back into the community. Um, and not to mention all of the women that I work with that are in long term recovery who struggle. You know, we seem to also, as a state, think that um, abstinence or recovery is the end result, like where we all just grab our sobriety tag and ride off into the sunset to live happily ever after. And that is not my experience. Um, I, have, I have been made to, to struggle with more since I entered recovery than I did before because I have to be present. So there's just not enough um, support for us. Um, and there's a lot of talk um, about us without us. There's a lot of, of, of in information that's going on where there's no one, you know, we have panels of senators and people from the law enforcement and there's no one up there from that's in recovery. Um, and so we have the answers to all of the questions, but if we're not asked, we can't tell. Um, and so, and not to mention also the amount of women that I work with who do uh, suffer with trauma history. I, I don't, I, I'm gonna say all of them um, to some extent. And there is not enough, um, you know, I was 13 years sober before anyone even suggested that there was such a thing as trauma-informed therapy. Um, and so what we do also is very, is to connect women immediately with those services to let them know that they do exist and that they don't have to suffer in their recovery. Um, God, I was really nervous and I wasn't, I wasn't sure I was going to have anything to say, but thank you very much. Well, I appreciate you guys being here and allowing, you know, I, I wasn't sure I was going to testify, um, but as soon as um, this lovely lady stepped up here to talk about the substance use um, issue, and again, you're absolutely right, it's not just, you know, a lot of people are talking about the opioid epidemic, but there are many women who are suffering um, with alcoholism, or not even alcoholism, but troubled um, drinking, uh, abnormal drinking, if you will, and our society, as I said, um, normalizing abnormal drinking, which is quite dangerous. Um, I think that's it. I need your help, basically. I'm, so we're not, I'm not funded. I'm funded by the Bank of Meta currently. Um, and, you know, I, and part of that, honestly, is because I don't necessarily want to operate the way that I would need to. Um, I don't want to make I know this is going to sound terrible, but I don't want to make like stats and reports and paperwork more important than the women that I am serving. Um, so I have we've been doing um, crowdfunding and um, having uh, Facebook fundraisers, and we've so far been doing well enough with that. But again, I'm a I'm a like one woman show, and I'm flying all over the place. I'm in the middle of the night and whatever to be there for these women who are calling me, um, not literally, but figuratively from a bridge ready to jump. So um, I need all the support that I can get and um, I'm open to suggestions and uh, collaboration. Um, I have all of the stuff in my brain um, and I have a lot of experience with all the things. So um, I would love to make myself useful and also um, yeah, we're gonna be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I have a we're BFF, absolutely. Um, oh, did you have a question? I have a question for, are you located here in Brockton? Um, we have an office in the uh, Brockton Family Center. I'm sorry, what is We that? have an, o an office in the um, Brockton Family Center, so it's um, Community Connections of Plymouth County. And we also have, um, we're also, we have groups in Holbrook and also qu at the Quincy Family Resource Center. But I'm looking to expand, you know, because it's, it's very much needed. Could you make sure you leave your information with us Ooh, prior yeah, to I have flyers. Thank you. Well, you, as soon as you said you were nervous, then I felt better. Thank you. Well, and I'm, I'm wearing the colors, too. <laughs> yes. Well, Julie, thank you. You're doing wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate very your time. much for thank your testimony. You. Is there, 
Is there anyone else who would like to stand up and speak or has anything that they want to say? Because it turns out that we are at the end of the people who have actually signed up. Barbara. I just wanted to, uh, not a plug for the Family Center here in Brockton, but they're wonderful. We uh, refer people all the time over there because they're doing, they have um, legal clinics, they have, um, Um, they're just kind of that, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Mass 211, but they're kind of like a face-to-face -face Mass 211, helping people with services. And they're all over the state, so as you, as the commission goes around, and you do go all over the state, right? So the family centers are all over the state, so if somebody's recommending something new to the community, the family centers usually can take those on, you know, bring in those kind of services if a building doesn't exist. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that. We use them quite a bit and they, we find them very valuable. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. It's good to know. Okay, yes? And just tell us your name. I didn't plan on speaking. My name's Pat Kelleher, and I'm president of Family and Community Resources in Brockton. Can you just say that a little slower? Oh, sure. It's the butterflies. Um, my name is Pat Kelleher, and I'm president and CEO of Family and Community Resources in Brockton. Um, along with the uh, Health Imperatives, um, who has a shelter program and other um, domestic violence programs, with a community-based program for survivors of family violence. Um, we also have a child witness to violence program, um, an offenders program for uh, Bristol, Norfolk, Plymouth County, and the Cape and the Islands. Um, and we also have um, five sites for supervised visitation um, cases, both for court referred cases where the children reside with one or the other of their biological parents or a grandparent. Um, but also for um, parents whose children are in out of home placement through DCF. In that one program over the last two years, we've lost eight parents, biological parents, to opiate addiction. So I concur with that, what everybody says here. Um, every program that is here that has spoken tonight works together. None of us do this in isolation. We all have the same problems. We deal with transportation issues. We deal with um, language issues, cultural issues. Um, families who work, families who are not working, huge immigration issues, huge confidentiality issues, um, child sexual abuse issues, which is on the increase, human trafficking for young women and young men, which is on the increase. But one of the issues that we've seen through our behavioral health clinic, which provides trauma-informed services to victims of any type of trauma, their home burned down, in the city of Brockton, unfortunately, we have drive-by shootings, um, just horrific trauma. Many of the parents who come to us and the grandparents work for a living, and so we have evening hours, and that hasn't become a struggle. Some want a male therapist and some want a female therapist, and that hasn't been a struggle. Some need a psychiatrist, so we have a psychiatrist who's there. They don't speak a language, we can work with the Help Brockton Neighborhood Health Center and try and collaborate with them. What has become a huge issue for working families is their insurance. It is not their lack of insurance for behavioral health services, it is the astronomical co-pays that these families are faced with. And they cannot go any place to get help with those issues. And what happens is they don't go for services. When you look at those um, offenders of gun violence and how many of those they've said they have mental health issues and if they'd only gone someplace, or if they're a, vict a survivor of domestic violence and they've been through advocacy and they've done everything anybody and used every option somebody has given them, but they need ongoing long-term trauma therapy and they can't get it because there either isn't enough funding to pay for master's level trauma trained therapists who get the domestic violence and sexual assault field. There are many good therapists out there who don't understand DV and sexual assault. So if nothing else, I know that insurance is a huge political issue. It needs not be. It needs to be a human issue. 
and we need to take care of our families and our children. And I thank you. I need to say that I'm also very disappointed. The last time I spoke before the Women's Commission was in Randolph many years ago, and there was a man from Randolph who got up and spoke about the need of all these services for the women he saw who came through his town. And I'm looking at this audience, and I'm thinking, here we are in this huge city of Brockton, and we don't have one man here to speak. Not one. Thank you. But, you know. Also, one of the things that I noticed in listening to all of you who have spoke so powerfully today is that there's a lot of overlap in terms of the populations that you're serving. And that's very true in Boston, too, where I do a lot of my work. And um, one of the things that I've been encouraging some of the organizations that I work with is to find people who are working with the same population and collaborate more. Oh, trust me. The city of Brockton, I think, is, has to be a master plan for collaboration. Oh, that's it fantastic. It doesn't make Thank any you. difference what it is, whether it's the health center or the hospitals or health imperatives or the WIC program. It's a very big sandbox at Brockton. We all try and play in the same sandbox. Not, it doesn't always work, but when you're talking about people's lives, that's when we all come together. I, I knew you looked familiar. You know those young people that were at that meeting in Randolph did continue working with the city councilors to kind of invigorate the youth council piece. It was fabulous. Yes. They, I heard about it. I said, okay. So I was like, she looks familiar. So, yes, well, Shane nice. Shane is also my boss. So it's okay. Yes, nice, nice. But I, I agree with you. I was looking around like, okay, where are the men of Brockton? You know, but a lot of times... Again, we're back to Brockton is a melting pot of different cultures. And you got to think about the Cape Verdean men. You got to think about the Haitian men. You got to think about, you know, the different Caribbean men and so on. And this is not the venue they would, men don't come out and talk on women issues, you know. But, you know, and I, I, I support you. So maybe we drop a little hint to Brockton and Plymouth Regional that, you know, maybe we need to put... I put it out there, women's issue host, uh, discussed by men or something. That's and a see great what, yeah. That's an awesome idea. I will say that when promoting this event uh, for this evening, um, I encouraged some men to come out and they said, oh, can we come to that? I was like, uh, yes, you need to be there because as women, we're needing the support. And also, you're needing to be the catalyst to be the educators to the other men. So out of those conversations, only one came, but then he had to leave and attend another event. So we do have to do more. Pat, can you at least sign your name oh, sure. on the list so then we yep. at least have your in information? Thank you. Thank you very much. A free towner. Woo! <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes, go ahead. Primarily to Kim and I'm part of the NAACP in Brockton, and we work closely with the um, sororities that, that are, are for black women, and uh, they've done so much in Brockton. They've helped get playgrounds fixed. And talk about collaboration. How many, how many sororities are there? You tell the story. I'll tell the story. Um, so there are a number of um, what we call the Divine Nine organizations that are represented here in Brockton, Massachusetts. There's Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. There's Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. There's Zeta Phi Beta Incorporated, as well as Sigma Gamma Rho. And uh, just recently, we all collaborated together for the um, voter registration. And I would like someone from my organization, Nancy, who is here, who actually led that really to talk about those collaborations. But um, as a chapter of Psi Iota Omega, we've done a lot of work around women's issues, working with young girls, um, establishing um, the, the park over at Mulberry, and working on particular initiatives with the NAACP around educating our communities to the importance of education and going to historically black colleges and universities um, where a number of our kids here in the community 
uh, need to know that there is an alternative going to uh, the predominantly white institutions where there's more of a cultural co collective and support where they can also receive the same education and not necessarily be placed in cultural shock you know, when it comes to academic institutions. Uh, but um, we do a lot here within, New York, within Brockton and also feel as though that there is a, an importance around civic engagement as well. So it's not just Alpha Kappa Alpha, but Delta Sigma Theta, who is also represented here this evening. Uh, we have worked together on numerous, numerous, and someone said that when it comes to Brockton, we are a bed of collaboration where we work together to move forward um, the community and issues that are impacting uh, not just women of color, but all women and young girls. Nancy. Good evening. Um, I did not expect to have any remarks. Uh, my name is Nancy Rachel Rousseau, and as the commissioner for the Brockton um, Commission on Women's Issues indicated, I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and the voter registration event that she referenced was a, an inaugural initiative that we hosted in September in an effort to celebrate and bring additional awareness to the National Voter Registration Day. Um, and on that day, uh, as Kimberly uh, stated, we partnered with our sister sorority members of Delta Sigma Theta, Sigma Gamma Rho, um, as well as Zeta Phi Beta to get together and basically blanket the South Shore. And our target were, uh, were young people uh, in high school between the ages of 16 and 18, those that are in the position to pre-register. And we registered 571 teenagers yes. on that day. And we also um, scheduled a couple of other opportunities. So not only did we reach the high schools, which were our primarily, um, were primarily our target, but we also partnered with a couple of colleges and universities. So we worked with um, Bridgewater State University, as well as Eastern Nazarene College, and I know I'm forgetting one other school. One, we. It was Quincy College, and um, we hope to partner with Stonehill next year. Uh, and it was um, an effort that um, gave us some very strong learning lessons, um, one of which uh, young people are very much more engaged in civics than what I have ever witnessed in the past. Um, lots of them t eager to um, register to vote. And we covered um, a cross-sectional um, of, def of demographics. So we went to Xverian in Westwood. We went to Milton High. Uh, we went to, of course, Brockton High, uh, Stoughton High, and we really, um, covered almost every area, inclusive of um, Randolph High, which was extremely successful because we were able, well, in addition to bringing them the access, uh, we were able to partner with um, Jim and 94.5, as well as Mass Vote. So Brockton High actually um, set aside time to allow us to host a seminar for the young people to learn about voting and civics and why they needed to participate. And um, Gemini 94 5, of course, provided the music and prizes. So it was festive, it was fun, very, very engaging. Uh, the staff was even very, very involved in terms of helping young people who didn't have their IDs, uh, being able to provide them with the last four digits of their social security number. So it was an effort that was um, truly collaborative in spirit and an opportunity to really demonstrate that um, if you bring the access and the opportunity to young people to register to vote, they in fact will. And they all knew um, that they were unable to actually participate until you know they turn 18. Um, they understood that. Uh, so it was a very sex uh, successful event, and the anticipation is that we will continue to um, do this. Um, it was um, what I would deem a very low lift, frankly. And um, 
we were very conscious about um, making sure that we reached as many schools as possible, um, partnering with these principals, and hope to do so e even further on the South Shore and spread out even further across um, southeastern Massachusetts. Thank you. Hi, Danella. <laughs> um, Oh, it's for the oh, it's for the it's for the cable. So, Nancy, thank you for that. I think um, all of the testimonies this evening have been great. Um, I'm particularly inspired by that, particularly because of the locations that you went to. When I think about a Brockton High, and I think about the population of students that Brockton, in particular, serves, and I think about the results that we're seeing all across America in voting, and the increase in women voting in particular, in um, people of color. We know how powerful uh, the black women vote has been over these past uh, election cycles. But what I love, and I might encourage you to do at some point, is Secretary Pizer recently for this incoming uh, school year, or school year September 2019, has sort of mandated that civics be reintroduced and all eighth grade students have to learn it. So I love what you're doing at the high school level. When I went to, to Natick High, civics uh, was a requirement, and I was so pleased when he put that back as um, a mandatory. But I love how you've involved Jim in 94.5, and you know, when you hear all of the things happening with voter suppression, and I would encourage too, I hope other high schools will add in the seminar so that you could tell young people sort of what to watch out for and that their vote matters. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that. Incredible um, results. I, I think you should go talk to uh, Mayor Walsh and other parts of the Commonwealth. It's really, really important. You, you see some people across the country crying when you look at what happened in Georgia and what happened on our HBCU campuses where kids couldn't get to vote. This, this is critical. I thought you were going to get up and talk about my life, my choice, but <laughs> I, I love this. So thank you. Great work. Thank you. Okay, and, and may I just add a quick comment before your question? Yes, yes. I just wanted to uh, share that at Brockton High, we actually had registered 163 of those, of that four, 571, and at Randolph High, which we're pretty certain the music had a lot to do with it, um, we registered 103. So just to give you some numbers. Um, I wanna just follow up because you're right, we need, this message needs to go statewide. Did you have any media coverage on this event? Did any newspaper cover this? Uh, just local. Uh, Randolph, Never made it Herald. to the Globe. No. Um, it was the one area that we just didn't have as much time to focus on. And we actually had reached out to uh, Boston 25. Um, and Good. however, unfortunately, they were denied access. Um, at Randolph High that day, and I, I stand corrected because we did have some media coverage on the Brockton Community News Station. The local cable? Local. So it was local so, all the way around. You know, though, it, I mean, the, one of the best things you could ever do would be to do these press releases, press advances, anything, and just bang them out, and you'll find the talk radio will, will catch on to it. I'd love to see some of all this work, it doesn't take much, it's a couple of paragraphs, but it is impactful and it does help you spread the word. Just that, just food for thought. This is great, I'm so excited yeah. to learn about this. going even in terms of you know we could call Latoya and be on NBC 10 on Sunday we're going as I think back um, you know I'm live in Boston mm -hmm. but we're getting ready for elections in 2019 City Council and such and we know that 2020 is going to be bananas so I would keep it going and and get the word out there in terms of because you have the data I, I didn't Incredible. think about that Incredible. but I'll definitely circle back on a, on, I, I, a topic that is related in a way what Danelle is talking about, the importance of civics, you know, and, and civic engagement and voter registration and voting. Um, one of the things that the commission is thinking about is how do we reach out um, to girls, you know, better. And one of the things that, that we've talked about, I mean, something that is going to, that we are going to be talking about is 
whether we have a girls' advocacy day that brings girls from the Commonwealth to the State House the way we do for you know adults from regional commissions. And it would be, you know, one of the things we want to know is if, if we do that, are there commissions that would have, you know, girls from their communities who would enjoy doing that? Come to the State House, meet your state rep, think about some of the issues that are important, what, you know, bills are priorities and um, whatnot. So that's one of the things that is on sort of our agenda to talk about. If the commission decides to pursue that project, I would very much want to be involved. So, Nancy, if you would sign the sign-in sheet, <laughs> legibly is always useful mm -hmm. um, you know with contact information in your organization that would be great and if you have anything information about this voter registration drive that you did mm -hmm. and you could submit it to us as part of your testimony that also would be really helpful for us to know it becomes part of our annual report but it's just just so that we gather that data I absolutely can I'm finalizing the report now and oh. then once it's completed the intention is to forward it on to all of the principals that were involved because they were strong partners, as well as I can get it on over to you. That would be. Okay. Okay, and I'll connect with you to try to get that door open. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And it is 6.30, exactly. So we are going to um, wrap up, unless there's anybody else who had anything they wanted to add. Leona, go ahead. Microphone. So the um, person, Lisa, that wrote something that Kimberly uh, read, um, a mom who has an autistic child, um, I just wanted to say that um, I think that we really, as a commission, need to do some work and some support for moms who have kids with special needs. Um, I'm very passionate about this work. Um, I have a personal experience with kids with special needs. Um, and I don't know how, as a commission, well, we can do stuff. Um, you know, the state, the Plymouth, we can do, you know, we need to really think about that because there are a lot of moms struggling with their kids that are in special education. The schools can only do so much, um, but it's really about supporting those families that are dealing with just madness. Um, I've lived it for 15 years, personally. And I know that, you know, you just need somebody in your corner to kind of be there, whether it be an advocate or just a support person. Um, so just to kind of mention, I'll give a, a plug <laughs> for myself. I'm also um, a member of the Brockton NAACP, and I'm running a forum on Saturday afternoon at the Brockton Library where we have um, education attorneys coming in to talk about special education laws and rights. Um, it's Saturday at 1.30 at the Brockton Main Branch of the Library on Main Street. So if you know people that could benefit from this information, I would strongly urge you to have them come out. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, then I'm, I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of upcoming important dates I did want to mention. Um, we are going to have our next public hearing is going to be on March 28th, um, 2019, at the Malden, um, the Malden Public Hearing on Women's Issues. It will be at the Senior Center Auditorium. And then um, our fourth and last public hearing of this um, a year is going to be in Dorchester, Mattapan, and it is going to be at the BYCF Perkins Community Center on April 25th. So, and those are public, those are open. Spread the word. Um, <laughs> Nancy, sign in. <laughs> I'm sorry. So just like our Facebook page, 
Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. That way you'll be able to follow all of the things that we do, because we do more than just the hearings. We have an unsung heroine event where this year of 2018, we recognized um, 210. That's something like that. 196. 196 women across the Commonwealth. Then we have a Women's Advocacy Day that um, we do every year. So there are, there are other things that we need your support. Um, as um, my chairperson, Assistant Commissioner said, we have 11 regional commissions now across the Commonwealth, and we plug everything and all of our sister commissioners. So we have hearings in different parts of the Commonwealth that the state commission doesn't host but we sponsor and collaborate with our, our younger sister commissions and all of the other local municipal commissions such as Brockton and Melrose and all of that. So please like our Facebook page. We're trying to step up our social media game. We are trying to create a brand that women across the Commonwealth will be proud to say we are part of Massachusetts, right? So thank you so much for coming out. Now back to the chair. Thank you. That's it. And we're adjourning. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for everybody who testified. Such powerful things people said. Thank you.